Welcome to Wesley's channel, this is Wesley's News. Today I'm going to be having conversation with John, the friend of mine. Uh, the conversation is related to general subject of what is and what is not. But there are plenty very much usable information here. And the last five minutes of the video, you're going to see the schematic of Ruslan. The Ruslan is from Riga, from Latvia. And he used DALI device, DALI schematic. He made enhancement, he made changes to it. The schematic is included, but the video is not translated. That It's a video that is as a preview to the discussion. This conversation is not made to translate anybody's video, but to enjoy the time while talking about free energy. Again, free energy must come from somewhere and be utilized to our needs. There is no free lunch, but free energy doesn't have to be paid for. Thank you very much. But John, you gotta repeat what you said. I'm sorry. The voltage is the voltage. When you have a ratio of the transformer, 1 to 20, for each volt delivery, you have a 20 volts from the other side. So 220 volts from one coil that goes to the rectifier is not a mystery at all. It is quite possible. Well, you know, with the current you're working with, the microwatts of power that's being induced there to operate a light bulb just doesn't seem practical to me. You know, but again, when you investigate this thing in Europe, you'll, you'll find out if they actually have something that works. But I don't see any magic well, there. Well, well, nice well. oil. I don't see anything special about it. Uh, you're, you're saying this is uh, somewhat the equivalent uh, that they're going to be able to start up with 12 volts. It's going to fire up. It's going to generate power to run a power supply and feed that back to operate the coil on a continuous basis without any additional power. You know, uh, there's diminishing returns with feedback. And uh, I don't know where the energy that you're talking about is going to come from because there's nothing there that's going to produce magical energy appearance. Well, that's why I came with the electrostatic pump. That was originally my idea. I have a few guys who are pretty eager to agree with it as well. So say, Khan is not really electronic engineer, he's a chemist, but uh, he understands pretty much a lot in electronics. So he was kind of familiar with the whole subject, not necessarily with this one. But then I have a few guys from Germany, and they write to me. They, they, they contact me. Those guys are pretty eager to really agree to the electrostatic pump. Electrostatic pump is based on the inertia. So he, although the electrons, unpaired electrons, they have a very small mass, but there is a volume. And then they, does the electron flow have an inertia? And he said, yes, no doubt about it. So you put the body in motion, stay in motion, that would be in the vacuum. But then when you put it in motion, you stop the influencing factor, it's still going to be in motion for the for the very fraction of the second. Well, I agree with that. The inertia is going to be there, but the fact that it's very small, and to stimulate enough motion of electrons in the quantities you're talking about, takes a lot of power. It's just not there. But, you know... You're the one working on it. Yeah, well, the, the whole concept of, of, of inertia was picked up by me publicly so many times. Definitely I have agreement of quite a large number of the audience. So say few of them, only the valuable guys who understand what's and why. It's kind of similar to the swing. When you're pushing swing with the right frequency at the right moment, you're creating the swing of the swing with a child on a swing. You're creating an inertia. You're actually tapping on the right moment. And it moves at a time when there was no influencing factor on it. With a very small impulse, you can make the bridge going to the vibration that can potentially damage the bridge. The coma bridge. Oh, absolutely. That's true. But you have a lot of energy to do that in the wind at 40 miles an hour. So now, look, you got a swing. You're pushing it with your finger. Just a light touch. And you keep the child swinging on the swing. Okay, forget your finger. Let's put a generator at the top that's being turned by the swing. And we'll take that voltage and run it back to something that's going to push the child. It's not going to work. And that's basically what you're doing. You give 
will work for a certain length of time, but eventually it's going to run out. So that's basically what you're dealing with. If you found a way to uh, get around them, I mean, you eliminate friction, you eliminate resistance, you eliminate the effort needed to keep it going. It will go by itself. You're not doing that. A lot there to be looked at. No, I'm looking at a question from a different way. It would be the small force over the time, the frequent per period. Now, you're not using the, 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 the strong force or the huge force of the wind for the Tacoma. You just imagine that you have that imaginary bridge and you're using the small force at the right moment and you're creating the increase of the amplitude. Now you're getting to the resonance. That resonance, the inductive and the capacitive reactance is equal to zero. Well, you know, that goes back to the turn of the century, previous century. When Tesla was working, he claimed that you know he could bring down a building with this little tiny machine, and people built that machine, actually hooked it up to bridges and to steel structures, and found out that it didn't happen the way he thought it would. And they tried it many different ways, many different designs, followed his work exactly, and it didn't work. So, uh, well, that's basically what you're claiming. I like to you to be a skeptic because that is that uh, massage my brain that I have to think about it. If you do not have too much of the exposed end of the coax that is shorted on the top of it, that coil might have very much little to none interaction with the outside world. Then you have a coil that is L2 and the capacitor is not connected anywhere. Now we have a little to none of the signal from that coaxial coil that is influencing that coil L2. With the capacitor and that coil is tuned to the resonance. That coil is interacting with coil L1 and coil N L1 is an coil that is connected to one of the blocks of impulse forming circuitry. And then you have another coil which is would be L4 and that would be the one that's connected to the rectifier to the light bulb. But I'm looking at right now is a part of the schematic and I'm wondering what is the possible interaction. Would they conform anything about the electrostatic pump that is based on the inertia? Okay, well take a piece of coax, okay, RG5080, whatever you want to use. Now, you take one end, you put a connector on it, you're going to supply it with whatever. Now you make it X amount of length. Take the other end and you cut it and you have a little bit of the center conductor sticking out. Very, very tiny bit. You take the braid and fold it over so it's touching it, and then you ball solder it. Now, there is no length out of the shield at all. Now, yes, at certain frequencies, you're going to get different standing waves on that, okay? But here's the rub. No matter what you build, your coil, your caduceus coil, whatever, has losses. The source has losses. How do you overcome the loss? The loss is degrading the structure. That's what you have to do is overcome the losses. Is it possible? I don't think so, but maybe there's a way of doing it. There's no secret to that. You have to overcome the losses. Explain how the losses are overcome. You may have a viable system. What I believe, what, I, what I'm looking at is when I have a ground wire connected to the ground, which not, actually I don't have to have a ground wire. If I have a counterpoise, that should work as well. But let's say I have a ground connected. Um, creating a mass of an electrons, unpaired electrons, that would have a certain inertia by on flowing. Then we have internal valves in between the impulses, where that inertia is not instantaneously stopped. That mechanism is a very much like a swing at the right time, and very much like a Tacoma bridge, if we just forget for a moment that we had a wind on it at that time, and the wind at its own big power was the influencing factor, but let's say there was somebody that was stopping at the right time. Theoretically, it would match the equation, wouldn't that? Without the wind, there would be no failing Tacoma bridge. I mean, that's why it failed, besides the design being incorrect. But also, you're talking about electrons. Electrons spinning, revolving around the nucleus and all that, but they do that by themselves, no stimulation required. Move them to have a chain or a flow of current, 
we need some energy to impart on that field. Where does that energy come from? And how do you continually get that energy without placing energy into a circuit? The feedback loop is a wonderful idea, but losses cancel the feedback loop. That's, you know, look, uh, Dick, of course, knows a lot more than I do, but I don't see where you can overcome losses. And we're not talking about taking it down to cryogenic temperatures and making things zero, but just a simple coil that you're dealing with, a tuned circuit, and it has losses. So tell me how the losses are eliminated. You need to move electrons somehow. Well, at first, you're moving the electrons because of an impulse. So you're connecting the battery to force at the beginning though. But now we have an atmospheric coupling that, let's say it's happening, it's not a joke because so many guys claim that it happened, whatever, whatever, I claim that it happened. I claim that I saw it also. So let's say we started a device and we have a losses. But for some reason we're creating an electrostatic field. And for me, at least thinking about magnetizer is like we're creating seven kilo amperes at 1,000 volts tremendous amount of energy comparing to what we powering it from 15 amps 110 volts so what is the secret it's a time there is a time to load the uh, capacitors to <laughs> it's no magic that energy must come from somewhere we just charging the capacitors to the right uh, energy level towards and then we discharging it in very quick fashion. Now we have a huge impact over the very short period of time. What I'm trying to see is what is happening exactly in that circuit that would support the electrostatic um, pump theory. How would that couple with something like a wind? Let's say we have a Tacoma Bridge and somebody was just doing the tapping, 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 and all of a sudden we have a wind that is taking over. At the right moment, at the right time. Well, I keep thinking of it in all different directions. And uh, notice if you have a resonant length of cable, it has a mechanical resonance. The wind is blowing gently. You will see that cable rhythmic to it. it stops, okay? It stops. Period of time. Grab it with your hand and shake it and do the same thing. You're not applying energy to it. It's not going to keep performing. My whole problem with it is you can't get something for nothing saying, okay, undiscovered energy is going to come from somewhere. So the energy that we, we are not, I know you know we have to put energy into it. There's no free lunch, you know that. That's coming from is the problem. We're bringing out all of these mysterious coils, and the, the, but there is no mystery. We know everything about coils. Losses. So you can eliminate losses if you have a problem. But you know what? I mean, you got you got Roy, a bright guy. Why don't you uh, write a thing to him and let him review it and see what he thinks? We'll see something in your uh, description that makes some sense. Yeah, definitely. Well, the thing is that I have uh, three skeptics. Dick, I have you, and I have Roy. Beautiful. What from you is telling me that it cannot work, which is also good. The problem would be my receptors. I've witnessed twice something that should not work and was working. One was at the decay house. The other one was in Lithuania experiment. And I've seen that same effect at the very beginning in 2010 at my own desk. Eric says, you cannot operate like that. You gotta have a very much steady scientific environment. He was right. Guess what? I took it apart and never put it back. I should never touch it. The problem with my receptors. So if it was only me, it's not a big problem. That means my receptors could be full around by myself. And it's only me. So the word is normal, I'm abnormal. But then we have a number of people who claim they have it. Number of people who claim it works. Then we have a tiger who says, well, I sit 45 minutes on my table before my, my ferrite broke apart from the vibration. Then we have another guy who is a, a Vasmus, whatever. Then we have a Kua. 
And right now we have Ruslan from Latvia. And he showed a device that works the same way. All of those devices all together work exactly in the same concept using a short pulse from the battery and then device works by itself. We have uh, too much of the notion. Now we can ask ourselves, do we have emotion? Or we all are being pulled apart. How about if that whole scientific word of John, Glenn, Roy, didn't see something that is happening? How about, is that possible? Or is it completely impossible? A, I don't see it happening only because of what I've been taught in the past. What I've been taught in the past could be wrong? Of course. But until we know, look, we have dark energy, dark matter. We have no idea what it is. But we've labeled it. We can't see it. We can't measure it. can't do anything. But it's there. And we're pretty sure it's there. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a mystery. So, yeah, I'm a skeptic because of the way I was trained. That's all. John, work on models. We don't understand something that fits to our model. Then we add something that is unexplainable, but it's, it fits the model. Strong force, weak force. Physics doesn't explain that. And apart from it, John, you are a scientist. Why? I'm having another meeting with those gentlemen that come from Stanford. They're going to be here. And I believe they're going to be bringing a gentleman who has to do with uh, radiological devices. Uh, he's not from Stanford, though. He's from Kentucky, some university in Kentucky. He might be coming, too. So, you know, and I discuss it with them, and I see what they know. And look, in my field, I was one of the best. I, as I told you, I was paid an obscene amount of money for what I did. But that was a very narrow field. So I'm not broadly educated in all of the areas of science. I know nothing about chemistry, you know, except the very basics. I don't pretend to. I never needed it. But it is interesting, but I don't have the time to educate myself to become a chemist. So, uh, you know, what's happening in that area? I have to just believe the experts. But uh, I will bring this up in the conversation and show them the diagram uh, and you know, see what they think about it because they also believe that, you know, there's no free lunch and there's no energy coming that's going to be coupled back or, you know, even if feedback loop loops, there's loss. So it's just wild stuff. Strong force and a weak force is also force. It's a big force. Without that force, we wouldn't have a word. We wouldn't have you. I couldn't hear you, and you wouldn't be talking to me. What this comes from? Those are the models that you talk about. I agree with the models. They're the best we have right now. And, you know, CERN is looking into other types of models and other types of theories that they think may be going on. But you're right. We have strong force, weak force. Electromotive force, photoelectric uh, devices. Do we know how they work exactly? No. We don't understand gravity either. Does gravity pull us down or does gravity push us? Gravity push us toward the Earth. You know, these are all things that are still open. And our models work for us as they're set up now. Now, some of the models are starting to fall apart when we get into the quantum area. So, and that's basically where you're going. And there's a lot of mysterious things there. So, I don't know what to tell you. But until we find out what it is and we actually see one of these devices working, you're going to run into everybody being a skeptic. Unless they're, you know, just fervent believers that these things happen. A lot of them are going to be wrong. But there may be one or two guys out there that are doing something. That's what you're going to find out. That's your quest, your holy grail. How many guys knows what is strong force and what is weak force? Stop on the street of United States of America and stop 1,000 people. Ask them about strong force. Ask them what is radioactivity. How many people is going to give you the right answer one or zero per thousand 
So now you got to go to 100,000 people because then you may expect that somebody is going to give you the answer. And now you say, you expect people who believe in strong force, they know nothing about the strong force. Well, what you say might be right because you, you have to look at the elements of how deep you want to go with the analysis. Do you want them to know the quantitative amount? Do you want them to know the accuracy, the precision? What area are you looking at? Well, when you get to accurate and precision, I don't think anybody's going to know that uh, in the general audience. But what they've heard of it, uh, I'm sure that most people have heard those statements, strong force, weak force, what they would relate it to. That's a good question. I have no idea. But, yeah, I don't think there's many people that would be able to explain uh, the application of those forces, never mind scientifically how complicated they are, just simple what is the strong force responsible for? What is the weak force responsible for? What is the electromotive force responsible for? You know, uh, electromagnetic force. Uh, that they have, maybe they have uh, some issues with that. We deal with free energy that creates controversy, and nobody knows that what it is. It may not exist. But also many of physical processes, they're just filling up the hole of something that is supposedly be explained, but they don't know how. They skip the explanation how, they just say it is. See, if they said it, the strong force, it is there. They may say, like, free energy is there, we just don't know, we don't see it. Nobody's seen the, the, the strong force. That they know is there, they know they are able to calculate it, just don't know what it's coming from. So, we don't know what free energy is coming from, what source of the energy is converted, and what source of energy is coupled, like the big pipe with a small valve on it that you just turn on and then you have a big flow. Why don't say it's possible that free energy exists? We just didn't have the enough of evidence to explain what it's coming from. But also we didn't have a chance to see it because it's not in interest of the rulers of this world to make that happen. What is needed? One big news, one big media that would say, uh, you know, we have an article or we have an interview and we have a visual documentation of that, what we have seen. Then another media will go after it, and then we have a big hollow. That might of then be turned to, the, to something that would be named weapons of mass destruction. Never existed, but happened to create a war of Iraq. So, we have a paradox. Something doesn't exist, but make the motion. And then we have another paradox. Something exists, but doesn't make a motion. Do you see the contradiction between those two factors? Philosophically. Yes, I understand your dilemma. But uh, for someone to realize that if a free energy device was developed, and it was reasonable cost that everybody could afford. Do you think people realize that could lead to the collapse of the structure of the world in any way? They wouldn't relate that. You're giving them too much credit. Yeah, that's a good point, John. I would love to talk to you even more, although it's 2 o'clock in the morning. Yes, it is 2 o'clock in the morning, and... Uh, I do very much appreciate my chance to chat with John. I love those night conversations. It is not only that we need that free energy device to be finally released to the public by anybody else. And my job is for 
anybody else to try to build it. I don't care if I'm going to be the first. That is not my goal. My goal is make a change. And if I finish my Coleman, I will make a change as well. So, with that, I wish you good night and happy next day and the rest of the days in your life. This is Wesley, and it's Wesley's news. See you in part number six, where I would like to give more attention to not a casual conversation with John, but a translation of Ruslan and keep the subject of Delhi.